You mentioned to me offline, uh, we were talking about Russell's paradox and that there's a, a nice, another kind of anthropomorphizable proof of uncountability. Uh, I was wondering if you can lay that out. Oh yeah, sure, absolutely. Both Russell's paradox and the proof. Right. So let's, so we, we talked about Cantor's proof that the real numbers, the set of real numbers is an uncountable infinity. It's a strictly larger infinity than the natural numbers. But Cantor actually proved a, a much more general fact, namely that for any set whatsoever, the power set of that set is a strictly larger set. So the power set is the set containing all the subsets of the original set. So if you have a set and you look at the collection of all of its subsets, then Cantor proves that this is this is a bigger set. They're not equinumerous. Of course, there's always at least as many subsets as elements, because for any element you can make the the singleton subset that has only that guy as a member, right? So there's always at least as many subsets as elements. But the question is whether they whether it's strictly more or not. And so Cantor reasoned like this. It's very simple. It's a kind of distilling the abstract diagonalization idea without encumbered by the complexity of the real numbers. So we have a set X, and we're looking at all of its subsets. That's the power set of X. Suppose that X and the power set of X have the same size. Suppose towards contradiction, they have the same size. So that means we can associate to every individual of X a subset. And so now let me define a new set. I mean, another set. I'm going to define it. Let's call it D. And D is the subset of X that contains all the individuals that are not in their set. Every individual was associated with a subset of X. And I'm looking at the individuals that are not in that, their set. Maybe nobody's like that. Maybe there's no element of X that's like that. Or maybe they're all like that. Or maybe some of them are and some of them aren't. I don't, it doesn't really matter for the argument. I defined a subset D consisting of the individuals that are not in the set that's attached to them. But that's a perfectly good subset. And so because of the equinumerosity, it would have to be attached to a, to a particular individual. You know, and... Mm -hmm. But that let let's call that person. Uh, it should be a name starting with D. So Diana. Mm -hmm. And now we ask: Is Diana an element of D or not? But if Diana is an element of D, then she is in her set. So she shouldn't be, because the set D was the the set of individuals that are not in their set. Mm -hmm. So if Diana is in D, then she shouldn't be. But if she isn't in D, then she wouldn't be in her set, and so she should be in D. Mm -hmm. that, that's a contradiction. So therefore, the number of subsets is always greater than the number of elements for any set. And the anthropomorphizing idea is the following. I'd like to talk about it this way. Uh, for any collection of people, you can, you can form more committees from them than there are people even if you have infinitely many people. Mm -hmm. Suppose you have an infinite set of people. And what's a committee? Well, a committee is just a list of who's on the committee, basically, the members of the committee. So there's, there's all the two-person committees, and there's all the one-person committees, and there's the universal, the worst committee, the one that everyone is on. Okay, the best committee is the empty committee with yeah. no members and never mm -hmm. meets and so mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Or is the empty committee meeting all the time? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, that's, wow, that's a profound question. And yeah. does a, a committee with just one member meet also? That's yeah, a, maybe it's always in session. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So, th so the 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 claim is that there's more committees than people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Suppose not. Well, then we could make an association between the people and the committees. So we would have a kind of every committee could be named after a person in a one to one way. And I'm not saying that the person is on the committee that's named after them or not on it, whatever. Maybe sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But let's form what I call Committee D, which consists of all the people that are not on the committee that's named after them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe that's everyone. Maybe it's no one. Maybe it's half the people. It doesn't matter. That's a committee. It's a set of people. And so it has to be named after someone. 
Let's call that person Daniela. So now we ask, is Daniela on the committee that's named after her? Well, if she is, then she shouldn't be because it was the committee of people who aren't on their on their own committee. Uh, and if she isn't, then she should be. So again, it's a contradiction. So when I was teaching in Oxford, one of my students uh, came up with the following different anthropomorphization of Cantor's argument. Let's consider all possible fruit salads. We have a given collection of fruits, mm -hmm. you know, apples and oranges and grapes, whatever. And a fruit salad consists of a, a, some collection of those fruits. So there's the banana, pear, grape salad, and so on. There's a lot of different kinds of salad. Every set of fruits makes a salad, a fruit salad. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we want to prove that for any collection of fruits, even if there are infinitely many different kinds of fruit, for any collection of fruits, there are more possible fruit salads than there are fruits. So if not, then you can put a one-to-one -one correspondence between the fruits and the fruit salads. So you could name every fruit salad after a fruit. Might not be that fruit might not be in that salad, doesn't matter. We're just it's a naming, a one-to-one -one correspondence. And then, of course, we form the diagonal salad, which consists uh -huh. of all the fruits that are not in the salad that's named after them. Uh -huh. And and that that's a perfectly good salad. It might be the kind of diet salad if it was the empty salad, or it might be the universal uh -huh. salad, which had all fruits in it, if all the fruits are in it. Or it might have just some and not all. So that diagonal salad would have to be named after some fruit. So let's suppose it's named after durian, meaning that it was associated with durian in the one-to-one -one correspondence. And then we ask, well, is durian in the salad that it's named after? And if it is, then it shouldn't be. And if it isn't, then it should be. And so it's, again, the same contradiction. So, so all of those arguments are just the same as Cantor's proof that the power set of any set is bigger than the set. And this is exactly the same logic that comes up in Russell's paradox, because Russell is arguing that um, the class of all sets can't be a set, uh, because if it were, then we could form the, the set of all sets that are not elements of themselves. So basically, he's what Russell is proving is that there are more collections of sets than than elements because we can form the diagonal class you know the class of all sets that are not elements of themselves if that were a set then it would be an element of itself if and only if it was not an element of itself it's exactly the same logic in all four of those arguments yeah so there can't be a class of all sets because if there were then there would have to be a class of all sets that aren't elements of themselves but but that set would be an element of itself if and only if it's not an element of itself, which is a contradiction. So this is the essence of the Russell paradox. Um, I don't call it the Russell paradox. Actually, when I teach it, I call it Russell's theorem. There's no universal set. Uh, and uh, it's not really confusing anymore. At the time, it was very confusing. But um, uh, now we've absorbed this nature of set theory into our fundamental understanding of, of how sets are, and it's not confusing anymore. I mean, the history is fascinating, though, of the Russell paradox, because um, before that time, Frege was working on his monumental work, undertaking, implementing the philosophy of logicism, which is the attempt to reduce all of mathematics to logic. So Frege wanted to give an account of all of mathematics in terms of logical notions. And he was writing this monumental work and had formulated his basic principles. And those principles happened to imply that for any property whatsoever, you could form the set of objects with that property. This is known as the general comprehension principle. And and he was appealing to the principles that support that axiom uh, throughout his work. I mean, it was really, it wasn't just an incidental thing. He was really using this principle. And Russell wrote him a letter when he observed the work in progress that there was this problem. Because if you accept the principle that for any property whatsoever, you can make the set of objects with that property, then you could form the set of all 
sets that are not members of themselves. That's just an instance of the general comprehension principle. And, but the set of all sets that aren't elements of themselves can't be a set, because if it were, then it would be an element of itself if and only if it's not a member of itself, and that's a contradiction. And so Russell wrote this letter to Frege, and it was just at the moment when Frege was finishing his work, it was already at the publishers and, you know, in press, basically. But it's completely devastating. I mean, it must have been such a, a horrible situation for Frege to be placed in because he's finished this monumental work, you know, years of his life dedicated to this, and Russell finds this basically one-line proof of a contradiction in the fundamental principles of the of the thesis that completely destroys the whole system. And Frege had put in the appendix of his work a response to Russell's letter in which he explained what happened, and he wrote very gracefully, Hardly anything more unwelcome can befall a scientific writer than to have one of the foundations of his edifice shaken after the work is finished. This is the position into which I was put by a letter from Mr. Bertrand Russell as the printing of this volume was nearing completion. And then he goes on to explain the matter, concerns his basic law five, and so on. And It's heartbreaking. I mean, there's nothing more traumatic to a person who dreams of constructing mathematics all from logic to get a very clean, simple contradiction. I mean, that's just... Uh, you devote your life to yeah. this work, and then it's shown to be contradictory, and that must have been heartbreaking. What do you think about the, the Frege project, the philosophy of logic, the dream of the power of logic right. to construct the mathematical universe? So, of course, the, the project of logicism did not die with Frege, and it was uh, continued, and you know, there's a whole movement, the neologicists and so on, in contemporary times even. But my view of the matter is that really we should view the main goals of logicism are basically completely fulfilled in the rise of set theoretic foundationalism. I mean, uh, when you view ZFC as a foundation of mathematics, and in my view, the principles of ZFC are fundamentally logical in character, including the axiom of choice, as I mentioned, as a principle of logic. This is a highly disputed point of view, though, because a lot of people take even the axiom of infinity as not as mathematical, inherently mathematical and not logical and so on. But I think if you adopt the view that the principles of ZFC have to do with the principles of abstract, you know, set formation, which is fundamentally logical in character, then it's complete success for logicism. So the fact that set theory is able to serve as a foundation means that mathematics can be founded on logic. 